On today's episode of Kilts and Culture with USA Kilts, in honor of St. David's Day, we are trying the Welsh whiskey Pendarin Kilt. Welshman drink Pendarin! The history of the Gallic lands is one of struggle punctuated by moments of sheer brilliance. Tartan is Scotland's gift to the world, and it is your personal heritage story. Howdy, boys and girls. Welcome to Kilts of Culture. I am Rocky. That's Eric. Yo. Today, special treat for St. David's Day. We are rocking uh, the Pendarin Kelt whiskey. Our good friend Peter Lyons gave this to us. So thank you, Peter. We are going to try this today. Um, so happy St. David's Day, everyone. Happy St. David's Day. Indeed, indeed. Is it Kumaru? I always forget. I want to say Kumaru up Alia, but that's not it. Because that's Anglo Saxon. Yeah, I have no idea. There's just I, no vowels. I do not know any Welsh. So it's very light. Very light. I was just thinking color. that it is yeah. really pale. Yeah. Mac, why don't you come collect? So mm -hmm. there you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please don't run into it. There you go. And while you're well, back there, what do you tell, what tartan you have on there, Mr. Mac? I got Stort Hunting Ancient Hunt. Very lovely, very mm -hmm. lovely. Very nice. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Eric, what do you have on there? I'm wearing the Owen Glendur black with red in honor of St. David's Day. Very nice, and very pretty. Owen Glendur, the Welsh William Wallace, if you will. Yes. And today I have on my brand spanking new um, Stuart Old Weathered. Uh, made by our own Casey. Um, the uh, This is the custom weave that we did just because I wanted it to exist. Um, so a few people got in on this. One piece left if anyone wants some. Um, all right. Gorgeous. So what do we got here for Pendarin? Well, it's whiskey. It is. Oddly enough, it, it, it does smell so, like whiskey. Apparently a single malt too. Mm. It smells reasonably light, but, but as a good... There's a little oak. Yeah. Or not oak. Um, I don't know what I'm saying. It's got a kind of a Swedish smell to me as well. A little bit sweet on the nose. Well, that might be... Sweet and light. Mild aromas of peat smoke. So very mild. That's what yeah, they're yeah. calling. And the early morning at the rocky seaside and with warm marmalade on toast. <laughs> Just like Grandma used to make me it. When, in the morning. When you sat right. on the, sea, the seaside. The seaside, yes. Mm. All right. Matured in ex bourbon casks, finish of Scottish Isla cast, results of whiskey that blends light fruity notes with the subtle peaty influences. Okay. I I would agree mm. with essentially all of that. The uh, It's got a light smoke to it, not overpowering. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't necessarily get marmalade. Do you, Mac? No, I think it's but, just a sweetness. Yeah, a generic. Honestly, a that little bit of a maybe it's leading the witness, but I did pick up a little bit of that, like very burnt toast and marmalade. How often do we eat marmalade? Was that on the nose that was supposed to have the burnt yes. toast and marmalade? Yep. Yeah. yeah. See, I was. I don't know. I'm not Paddington Bear, so. All right. On the taste, what's on the taste? Taste on the palate, whatever. It's palate called. begin begins with great sweetness before the smoky. Slightly medicinal flavors descend. I love how they rationalize <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Strictly medicinal. I don't get a lot of sweet in the taste up front. I'm swirling it around a little bit. I get some with the medicinal. It's not like an iodine slash band-aid kind of flavor like you get with uh, an Isla Scotch per se. <clears throat> that's got a little bit of that hmm. a little a little earthy a little um but and and a, 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 a touch more smoke not a ton but a touch more than like than the minor on a scale a smoky scale of you know zero to ten like a three um i i agree though i think the smoke it doesn't come in smoke it, like the smoke like spikes it's, it's yeah, getting like any pepperiness. Smoke through the forest. Um, well, I think it's very short. I'm, they're saying the fin the finish is is slight bitterness follows 
It leaves a long, lingering freshness in the mouth. I don't know about freshness now. <laughs> There's a slight, a slight bitterness, a little woodiness. Yeah, I get the, I get the, the woodiness. End. That's kind mm-hmm. of what I'm picking up as the, the freshness. If you think of like, like a cologne, like some colognes or, or perfumes have like a wood smell to it or something like that for a fresh, okay. crisp kind of thing. So if that's the thing, a little bit because I'm still, it's still on the sides of my mouth. I'm still tasting it. Hmm. Um, the, uh, yeah, the peppery mist may be. Like, because we just opened it. So oh, yeah. maybe letting it sit for a little bit. Maybe As always. Some of it, like, less tannins or whatever. Um, I'm going to pour that it. There's a flaw with our technique, sir. Yeah. If I do say so. It's But it's pretty good. It's pretty good. I'm not mad at it. I would say if I wanted to introduce somebody to things that are peaty, I would give them this before I give them something like Lagavulin. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes. Agreed. It's it's a it's a light. It's It's, yeah. They're they're walking into the water, not jumping into the deep end. Exactly, of the pool. not the penguin off the island. It's it's the Coors Light <laughs> of PD scotches. Oh, it's not that bad. <laughs> I just want to hear your reaction. Oh. Okay, now touch of water. Let's see what happens. Kind of killed the peatiness. Did almost nothing. Yeah, it killed it a little bit. Water. I still taste the. A little bit of uh, I got the, the peppery the tannins pepper. kind of I get thing. the peppery more yeah. and the peat less, at least for me. Yeah, I give it that. Killed the nose. It did. Yeah. Hmm. You poured water in Mac? Just a little bit, yeah. Yeah. Wow. It really. Yeah. It died. It. It just. Yeah. Like, <laughs> done. Gone. Hmm. Gonesville, Daddyo. Hmm. I don't think that's ever happened before, where uh-uh. the nose was so affected. Yeah. By a little bit of water. Can you remember ever? No. I mean, or at least we haven't said it. Not off the top of my head. No. Yeah. I still kind of like it though. Yeah. I think I prefer it neat to to with a with them with a touch of water. I would agree. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, Mac, scale of 1 to 10. Uh, well, first, how do you just curious? How do you feel about it? Have you drank it with the water already or just no? a little bit, yeah. Okay. Did you prefer it with the with meat I, with I, no water? Or yeah, I think with water? no water. I think it just it like killed a lot of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um yeah, okay. I, problem with so, it being so delicate. All right. So let's let's judge it based on no water, what we had in there yeah. before. Cast your mind back. Yeah. I, I, I kinda agree. I think this is definitely one that if you're trying out, it's a good one to go to. It, it it's not bad. It's not great. It's mm-hmm. good. I maybe six seven. Six point seven. Okay. Okay. Not bad. Not bad. I would say this is more of a like a, a fall. It's not a full on. I was thinking that too. Yeah. It has a, it has a nice fall. warming effect. Yeah. You know. Um, trying to imagine what I would pair it with, but nothing's going in mind really. Um, a second one. <laughs> <laughs> um, the more you drink, the better I drink. Um, the more I drink, the funnier I am. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Probably like Mac. Probably like a six point eight, something like that. I like it enough that I would I would okay. serve it to guests. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna go a little higher. I'm gonna go seven three. I I enjoy it. I wouldn't go out of my way to get it, but if I'm buying a you know a bunch of whiskey as a sampler thing for a party or I'm hosting a tasting or something, I'd include this for just to have something Welsh. Just have something a little bit different, and because it's a a, a lighter Isla vibe to mm-hmm, it, mm-hmm. so okay, all right, cheers. Mm. So very good. Not bad. Not bad. <clears throat> Thank you again, Peter Lyons. Not bad at all. Like well, this it. is this is the only Welsh distillery. Is that correct? No, I think there, there's, no, there's more than one. I didn't think. I, yeah, I didn't just like the, I it's the, the first one. It's the first one. First yeah. commercially available whiskey produced in Wales since the 19th century. Okay. 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 So, all right. Very good. All right, boys and girls, load in your questions down in the comments. We are here, but your humble servants to answer whatever questions you guys have, kilts and or culture related. Um, while we wait for people to start loading in some questions, Eric, what do we have in our preloaded question? Well, hello there, Kitty. Um, first up, we have James J. Walker, who asked us, not Jimmy J. 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 Walker. Yeah. Dynamite! Give me the question! Kid, uh, dynamite! Sorry. Uh, uh, 
Mr. Walker asks us, is the Chieftain Vest a historically inspired garment like the ghillie shirt, or is it historically accurate? And uh, you know, the answer to this is pretty obviously pretty obvious. Obviously obvious, but we can elaborate. Sure. <clears throat> um, the uh, uh, Chieftain's Vest, a.k.a. what's the other one that... There's another maker that does a very, very similar vest and calls it something slightly Was different. Is it a hunting vest or something? Or no, a <sighs> woodsman's? I forget. Frontier. Frontier. Frontier's Frontier vest. vest. Yeah, yeah. That was it. Um, yeah. It's, is it historically accurate? No. no. It's it's fantastical to look like, you know, it may th- might have looked like you know, it's it's old timey looking clothing, but it's it's made up in a very similar way to the way that the, uh, uh, what's it called? Gilly shirt. shirt Jacobite shirt, shirt. Jacobite shirt. Yeah. Island shirt. Pilot yep. shirt. Yep. Um, so, nope. yeah. Is it? Is there any history to it? No. Uh, I actually called the uh, uh, manufacturer, the tailor over in Glasgow, and asked them, "Hey, how how long ago does how far back does this thing go?" And uh, they weren't quite sure. They just said, "Uh, probably." Like they have an in-house historian who does all kinds of stuff with them as well, and they said. Probably 1970s, not much further back than that. It yeah. is a costumey kind of thing. Um, the Highland shirt, we think, goes back to about the 1950s. 1950s. Yeah. yeah. So it, there was some, you know, uh, brigadoonery, perhaps. <laughs> um, That's a load of brigadoonery. That's indeed. what that is. Yeah. That should be a word. Yeah, um, it is now. Yes. Um, so yeah, it's it's a it's a newer thing, um, but with. Outlander and all the fantastical type costumes and things like that that aren't historically accurate. Is it something that should be poo-pooed and not done? Yes. <laughs> or Eric says yes. Um, or is it something that's just a new tradition? Uh, you, you said there's a, every tradition is new at some point. So I think the question is whether it's going to survive through wanton usage and gain a following. I feel like it's still very much a niche thing, a niche thing, if you will. Yeah. The um, more sometimes I see guys picking it up for a wedding um, or using it for some kind of more costumey look or something to wear to a festival, but it's not nearly as popular as you would think it would be if it were becoming new traditional dress. You know what I mean? Agreed. I think you see more people wearing a Jacobite shirt on its own or with something else. God forbid a sash, but you see that. Um, as opposed to people plunking down for a chieftain's vest. Um, yeah, so I don't think so. I don't think it's really much. If it's if it's a new tradition, it's not very strong. Agreed. Yeah. And I would I would say that I would argue perhaps that the Highland shirt has a bit more, a little bit more pedigree, only like twenty years or so. Mm. Um, and number two, it's. It's a little bit more, I, I hate to use the term accepted, but it's a little bit w- more widely used, widely seen. Yeah. Um, because it's, you know, it, it's for generally people in the diaspora to go to festivals or Ren fairs right. or, you know, Comic Cons or things like that. Anything where it's a costumey kind of for event. Fun. Correct. Casual fun. Correct. Yeah. Casual. Um, it's also the price point. So a, a, a Highland shirt, you're looking at 50, 60 bucks versus. Yeah. Maybe you know a couple hundred bucks for a chieftain's yeah, vest. It's easily. a little bit more money. Um, so yeah, I think that's part of the reason why. And I think that essentially it's the same audience. I think the concentric circles fully overlap. Um, the the people that would buy here's my concentric circles. The people that would buy a chieftain's vest fit squarely within the Highland the Jacobite shirt circle. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but not everyone who buys a Jacobite shirt would buy a chieftain's vest. Ah, I see, professor. Oh, yes. This is going to be on the quiz? It's going to be on the quiz on Friday. Damn. Yes. Okay. Wait, it is Friday. Pop uh, quiz, hot shot. Yeah. Ironically enough, the 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 provenance, if you will, of Cheaton's vest is weirdly older because it is basically somebody got the bright idea of taking a like a regulation doublet, a, a military-esque Piper's doublet, and just cutting the sleeves off, which is ironic because that both those garments way, 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 way back in time originally go to... 17th century doublets where the sleeves were actually sewn on or not sewn on but uh looped on with uh ties yep. so the sleeves were actually separate so you would take them off when you wanted to um it's 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 odd it's odd i actually used one of the chieftain's vests from inventory for my uh farby costume that i used for the um history of christmas in scotland video okay. 
uh, for my 17th century uh, Cromwellian roundhead esque outfit. I took a chieftain's vest and put it on like a doublet and then folded it back so you couldn't see the buttons, you know, and tied it shut and everything. And it's like, it it worked. Yeah, close enough. Yeah. <laughs> if, you look, movie magic. if you didn't look too close. Um, so it's it's odd. It, it is the silhouette is kind of classic, but the garment itself definitely is not. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. it's it all all fashion, you know, kind of a goes in cycles, b evolves, and kind of one thing comes out of another, comes out of another, and it just kind right. of rolls. So it's one of those things. Do do I think it will survive the test of time? Sure, in a weird niche and a niche and a niche kind of way, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, will it ever become like the main thing you see guys wearing at weddings? No, no, never. Will it become the main thing you see guys wearing to rent fairs and stuff like that? No. No. But, you know, maybe 2% of yeah. guys might own one or less. I think it's always going to be something that somebody wears for fun when they're manning the tent representing their clan at the uh, Highland Games. Yeah. That's about it, honestly. Yeah, it feels old timey, even but though it's not. not. Yeah. 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 Cool. Hope that helps. Wash day. All right, Mr. Mac. All right. So we've got two questions that came in about one of the newer tartans or older tartans um, out there. So uh, I'm going to lump them both together here in this. Okay. Um, so Thomas said, uh, I'm sure you've already gotten this question a million times, so please forgive him. Um, but are we going to see Glenn Affric in a possibly PV, PV down down the road? And Seamus is, is saying, after the discovery of the Glenn Affric tartan, do you see a new effort to search out for more older examples of tartan in Scotland? Okay. Hmm. Um, I have thoughts <clears> on that. Yes. The Is it going to be available in PV? Probably not for the foreseeable future. Here, here's my guess. Well, basically, here's where it started. Um, the cloth, the, you know, the Glen Affric tartan was actually owned by the Scottish Tartans Authority. They essentially licensed the House of Edgar to be able to weave it. They, you know, worked together to make sure that the yarns were correct. The thread count was, you know, as close to accurate as possible, that the, the dyes used were nice and that, you know, an accurate representation of the shades used way back when. However, uh, so it's just essentially just House of Edgar and 10% of the sales of the cloth get given to the Scottish Tartans Authority. So unless, you know, uh, uh, you know, a mill that does PV is willing to pony up and, you know, donate to the Scottish Tartans Authority, probably not. Now, here is me Nostradamusing a little bit. Um, I think that Pakistan will probably rip it off. Um, I think that the kilt makers in Pakistan, A, they already use... Um, uh, uh, private tartans or tartans that are not really, you know, supposed to be available or tartans that are supposed to be exclusive to one right. company or another company. Right. They already use those without permission and then just sell them and push them forward. Um, so if I had to guess, that will probably happen. Will we carry it? No, we would only do it through the proper channels. Um, yeah. now never say never. So at some point, if it proves to have staying power, if the Glen Affric tartan sticks around, uh, it stuck around for 500 years, but if, <laughs> if, it, if, it, if it sticks around for, you know, commercially viable for a year or two, then yeah, I would have a discussion with Martin Mills and say, hey, you, would you guys want to do this? But after I speak to Scottish Tartan Authority and kind of work something out, sure, potentially, um, but outside of a proper agreement in licensing and making sure, you know, the, the, the proper you know, portion was given to the Scottish Tartan Authority that we had their approval and that kind of thing because I'm speaking out of turn here. I have not talked to them about any of this. Um, but if that domino were to fall, then I could potentially I could potentially spill whiskey on my lap. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, dump that on the floor real quick. That's spectacular. Gotta love that. <laughs> we're going to do a take two on the show now. Um, <laughs> indeed. So special treat today, folks. Yeah, special treat. Rocky changes kill mid show. Um, Whiskey flavored sparring. <laughs> indeed. If Matt is watching, go ahead and bring me a towel. I need one. He just stepped um, away from his computer. <laughs> <laughs> Don't wear that home tonight. You're gonna get pulled <laughs> over, and you're like, I haven't had anything to drink off. I swear. Oh, yeah. <laughs> wow, that's a new wow. one. We've ne I've never spilled an entire glass all, of whiskey on myself. In all seriousness, I am sympathetic. I'm terribly sorry. It's all good. It's all it good. Should be fine, but. <laughs> 
at the same time. Oh, I'll laugh at myself all the time. It's fine. Um, yes. What was um, the other question about? Dude, that sucks. I'm, I'm um, upset that I spilled the whiskey. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Will the Glenn Affleck Tartan uh, story, as it stands now, result in more historic Tartans coming out? I think it might. Um, but here's the deal. Glenn Affleck is kind of unique in the sense that it had already been discovered as a specimen. And then what we've had happen in the last year is a result of uh, motivated, invi- yeah, motivated individuals going back and re-examining a specimen that had been languishing in an archive for ages, for decades. Will someone decide, hmm, maybe we should take a look at some of these other specimens we've got in the files? I think it's possible. But all research is the confluence of motivation and funding. Uh, Glenn Affleck had the good fortune of having both. Um, they had a, a powerful, the, the Tartan had a powerful friend in the Dundee Museum and the, uh, the, the STA and people over there were willing to put some money behind it to make sure the research happened. That's not going to be as easy to do in every situation. So how much of this will happen or how quickly, I don't know. Um, finding new specimens in archaeology in situ, in sites, is always the hope, but those are becoming fewer and farther between. Um, development in Scotland is not that big a country, and development is uh, making it harder and harder probably to find new um, archaeological evidence. Then again, you never know. So I, I, would... hope, I hope that this sparks interest in doing more, but it will depend on those factors. Basically, motivation on the part of somebody who wants to see it happen and funding to make it happen. I would take it a slightly different direction and it could be done and it could be done sooner rather than later. Hmm. I think there could be a revival of some of the Wilson's Bannockburn tartan patterns. <laughs> that is a different, that's a different, that's a Agreed. completely different type of what we're talking about, I think. Yes and no. They have unnamed patterns. They're mm-hmm. just pattern numbers mm-hmm. within the old, uh, you know, Wilson's pattern books. So if there are older patterns that aren't, you know, clan associated or things like that, I think there is a potential for those to come back um, or have a uh, some some niche interests within it mm-hmm. um, through historians, you know, putting things forward and things like that. And I know Peter McDonald's done a couple runs of, a, uh, I know he just did a McDonald one and he had another one that was an unnamed pattern, but there, there are dozens of unnamed, un, unnamed, unclaimed patterns from Wilson's, okay. um, which could be, you know, brought forth again. There's no copyright on them. There's no nothing on them. So why not? Now you say that everybody's going to be jumping to copyright them. So. <laughs> no, you can't copyright someone else's work, especially the, um, if it's already in the public domain. I, it's a different path from what I was imagining, but you're not wrong. The uh, I think you could see um, an interest in trying to uh, produce in, in, the, in the flesh, in the wool, so to speak, of uh, these tartans that have been on the books, so to say, for a long time. So yeah, how do you choose which one? That's the that's the real yeah. question. And how many or how many other? You no, know, we don't know. Like questions to ask the Tartan Authority. Do you have a file cabinet drawer with hundreds of unclaimed tartans? <laughs> what else is out there? What do we not know? What What are you hiding? Uh, <laughs> come forward. <laughs> the uh, so yeah, it's it's a question of. Are they going to find something else? Are they going to do research on the thing that they find? Is there other things that are out there? Uh, are there other tartans that are, you know, languishing in the back of a drawer somewhere, or in a file, or in a, you know, file folder, or file and cabinet, or under someone's mattress? Who knows? I don't think I don't think that a pattern in a book has the same magic in people's imagination as something that was an extant garment. I mean, part of the sizzle of Glen Africa is the fact that we know. It was woven and worn by someone at such an early, early time period. And, and we have a, a tiny, highly flawed, but still we have a glimpse into the mm-hmm. life of the time. And that's what makes it so mind bogglingly amazing. Yeah, the story. You know, whereas of Wilson's of Bannockburn number 73 is like, oh, cool. So I think it's, it's going to have to look really good. I think it's going to have to be a beautiful tartan. Because that's that's going to have to carry it. There's no story behind it other than saying, "This is a tartan that came from the archives of the great late Wilson's of Bannockburn." Well, Mill. here here's here's my cynical response. Yeah. Um, the the Glen Affric tartan was just a tartan found in a peat bog, so right. or you know forest you know kind of thing during the the, the reforestation. Mm-hmm. Um, so 
it probably was, you know, not Wilson's Bannockburn, but maybe Schmilson's of Schmannockburn. No, um, no, neither. It was homespun. Or homespun. There was no industry at the time. Fine. So it was homespun and it was a, just a normal pattern as well. You yeah. don't know what kind of garment or what it was from. Mm-hmm. You, We don't know because we don't know it was a garment. It was just, you know, handed over in a plastic bag. Yeah, but it was so, on somebody's body. You it, think it was? It probably what if it, was. What, what, if, what if it was like, you know, one of the, like the bandana you tie up and put it over the stick and you're walking down the trail? There's a name what for that. I can't remember this, but... I forget too, a bundle or whatever. I, I don't know. Yeah, bundle. It's yeah. just as that symbol. It's called a bundle. Anyway, I don't know. I mean, let's put it this way. Would you rather have a kilt made out of a tartan that was Wilson's of Bannockburn number 742 or would you have the recreation of a tartan found on a pair of trues found on the body of a Jacobite who had died at Culloden. Okay. I mean, sure. which one is going to feel more like get you in the gut? Okay, I, you know, I don't disagree. And if we find one of those great, if versus it's, it's, it's the story you spin with it. It's the marketing that mm-hmm. you put with it. So, or are you going to have, you know, the, the, the pretender tartan that house of Edgar came up with, which right. is the cover of that same pattern book. Right. Um, does it make does it make you speak of think of Bonnie Prince Charlie? What about the Glen, what about the uh Appalachian folklore tartan and all the meaning and symbolism that went but into that? That has a story. I understand. That was intentional. So what you're saying is marketing has to drive the thing? It can't just be a gorgeous pattern for being a gorgeous pattern. You need spinsters I think, I like it, us to come out there and be, Yeah, but I think it come has out to be with the, the, it's the a verbal lot magic. easier. It's a lot easier when there's a story like involving a body. <laughs> Death sells, folks. You know, exactly. death and sex. You, you no. need a dead body in order uh, for the tartan to exist. But again, like, you know, Wilson, you know, then you have to spin the story and get people excited about the fact that the pattern is from the time period it was, mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. the fact that Wilson's of Bankburn was a, an important entity in the history of Scotland. It's just not quite as strong to my mind. Could it, could you do it? Sure. Would I buy it? Probably. But uh, because I happen to love that color palette, as Mac over here agrees. So, but, um, yeah, I, I changed know. the green though. I don't like the green in it. Really? You don't, don't like the, the muted green? I don't I like, like the that green. green in it. I think it should be more of an olive because it pair. I think it pairs better with the the yellow and the the rust. So we need a palette that's going to be Mac Bannockburn. Exactly. Or, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Mac of Bannockburn. But yeah. interesting question. Yes, it could. It Either could way. Go. Oh, he meant the Glen Affric. He didn't like the green in it. Yes. Oh, he was I was talking, talking about the Wilson. Wilson's of Bank. Oh, the Wilson. Oh, I love that green. That's what. Yeah, that's that what green. we're talking about. Yeah, that yeah. green. Sorry, I was totally confused uh, me there. Sorry, I was following questions down here too, and and comments oh, that were coming. Doing in. Doing your job. So Mac wasn't paying attention. <laughs> no, he was doing his job. <laughs> his job is to pay attention to us and them simultaneously. <laughs> he must have a wow. split brain. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Anyhow. No, I think I think it could work. I think there's room. I think I hope to see more historical stuff come back. Um, and whether it's Wilson's Bannockburn, because you could spin a whole story about the mill and the importance to the entire industry and how they thrust everything forward along with the King's Visit, along with the Sobieskis working in tandem with the mills and da, 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 da. And you could spin that entire thing, um, you know, the unclaimed, unfound tartan book. Um, or find trues on dead guys. Okay. We'll see. Yes. Here's hoping either way. But what you don't want to do? is spill your Pandaren whiskey all over your kilt. And thank you, Matt, for bringing me paper towels. All right. That was Mac. There yeah, we go the next one. Okay. Andrew Wilson of Bannockburn. Now, Andrew Wilson uh, comments that some tartans apparently are only offered in 11 ounces. 11 ounce wool. Uh, unless, of course, you ask for a custom run of it in 13 or 14 or whatever. Uh, he's noticed that some kilt makers will use 11 ounce upon request while others won't use it at all. And a few will maybe be willing to make an eight yard kilt out of 11 ounce wool, but not something of less yardage, like a five yard. So he's wondering what's going on with this. Uh, why are the challenges or problem, you know, what are the problems or challenges in making kilts from 11 ounce tartan? Are there any benefits? Should the price be lower if you're using 11 ounce wool? Because after all, it's lighter. Right. So we'll bring Mac in for this one as well. The uh, uh, ultimately and Mac, you know, jump in here. If anything I'm about to say is, you know, against what you're thinking. Um, it's too light. The uh, 11 ounce fabric um, or La Karen, which is technically like 10 or 11 ounce. It's the Reaver cloth. 
Um, <clears throat> it's softer, it's lighter, and a five yard kill, it just doesn't have the same hang and drape. Um, it has a different hang and drape, which is great for women's stuff. It's not necessarily great for a man's traditional kilt. Um, it doesn't have the same heft and therefore swing in the pleats. Uh, it kind of bounces a little bit more for lack of a better term. Um, and it's, it's a lighter weight thing to sew with. So mm -hmm. it's not as, it's not as hardy, hard wearing, um, especially, you know, for, for the higher industry or the rental industry in Scotland, they would prefer a hardy, hard wearing 16 ounce or a hard wearing 13 ounce cloth, um, to a lighter weight, softer, uh, 11 ounce mask. Yes. Your, your thoughts on 11. <laughs> I, I agree with the kilted skirt, like being the women's garments and, and kilted skirts, the high hose skirt type thing, because they are shallow and, and it you don't want all that weight in something that's going to be that long. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you need the, you need, there needs to be some weight to it to. For a man's kilt. Yeah. yeah. And then that's why you do, we don't see five yards in it. it. It's an eight yarder is really your option. Yeah. It's, I At understand minimum. what they were. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, no, it's at minimum. That's what yeah. it would be. <clears throat> now, in an in an eight yard kilt, um, because you're not sacrificing the amount of cloth that's in the kilt, can you do you know an eleven ounce eight yard kilt and it, have it be okay? Sure, it's not ideal. I, I'd still rather have thirteen ounce or a sixteen ounce um, for an eight yard kilt, um, but it's 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 okay if you if you don't have the money to do a custom weave and you know, it's it's only available in eleven ounce. Sure. Yes. Now, we have uh, Michael in here saying that eleven ounce is standard for dance kilts. So I don't know. You know, if that's because there's a lot more physical activity in it. They're <laughs> bouncing around, jumping around a lot more, yeah. um, and it's it's a lot more. Yeah, it, it's they're they're exerting a lot more energy, so they're a lot hotter. Mm -hmm. So they want the mm -hmm. lightest weight fabric that they can have for right. for heat or right. lack thereof. It's a stage costume. Yeah, you're not necessarily expected to be wearing it any other time, just when you're performing. <clears throat> and also, what they what they do for a lot of the the dancers' kilts is they'll actually give it a two inch hem because they want a little bit more weight in the bottom to get a little bit more swing, a little bit more momentum out of the pleats moving. Um, yeah. Hmm. Any other thoughts, Mac or Eric? No. Nope. Okay. So ultimately, the answer is yes. You can do an eleven ounce. Eight yard kilt, most kilt companies will try to talk you out of it. And for a five yard kilt, yeah, I we like we would literally like like, are you sure? Can you sign this disclaimer that says you're okay with it? Can we not put our name on it because we really don't like how it's going to be? Um, so we're going to fight you tooth and nail on it. Um, we'll begrudgingly do it on an eight yard. We won't do, really want to do it on a five yard on our website. We don't offer eleven ounce. Uh, uh, tartans as an option for eight yard or five yard kilts because we really don't want people to just like accidentally pick it or pick it because that's the one that I like the look of not understanding the weight issue then they get the finished kilt and they're like wow this thing really doesn't feel as nice and it's kind of you know yeah it's too light or it doesn't feel like as it's like my other kilt that I have like yeah because it's 11 ounce so cheers yep all right that was you or Mac that was me that was you, Mac. All right. So again, we get we get questions that are that are really <clears throat> combining here today. Okay. Um. So again, this is a, a two parter. I get Alex. What's your favorite aspect of the Highland dress industry, and what is something you feel the Highland dress industry could benefit from changing? And Eddie <laughs> e, along those lines said, "Would a kilt made out of more su sustainable materials like hemp or bamboo still be a kilt?" Again, he's thinking of like the future, like mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. trying to come up with different ideas. Yeah. Um, what is our? What's, Those are what, two very different questions. Yeah, uh, I was yeah. looking at it as as he's changing the part future? of the yeah. like he's changing yeah. something yeah. out. Yeah. Of okay. it. yeah. What was the first one? What's our favorite part of the industry? Favorite part, favorite aspect of the Highland dress industry. The favorite aspect of the Highland dress industry is that it's not seasonal, and it's not fashion. Mm -hmm. Um, this, this is me speaking, you know, as, as an entrepreneur, <clears throat> I don't have to carry 
what colors are in this season and then worry about blowing them out at the end of the season before before school wear in the fall and then have to worry about what the winter wear is going to look like and then worry about, oh no, next year orange is going to be completely out. Who wants orange? Um, no, it's not that. It is consistent. It is the same. There is a thread of tradition that runs through all of it. There are, uh, let's say, micro trends within it, like the black kilt thing or the or the shadow tartan thing was a micro trend within it. And then the black metal finishes were kind of a micro trend. Now we're moving into the tweed trend and the weathered trend. And I would say we're firmly, you know, we're squarely in oh, that yeah. trend already. Yeah. We're starting to move into some marled yarns and things like that. So the, the thing that I like is that I don't have to worry about blowing out inventory before I can't sell it um, because it's out of fashion. It will always be in fashion. It will always look good. It will always, you know, clan tartans or clan tartans or clan tartans. There may be a new one or a variation or something cool and different, but it doesn't mean that Gordon Modern isn't going to sell the same way Gordon Modern has always sold. Whether that's scarves, whether that's kilted skirts, whether that's vests, whether that's a kilt, it's always going to be the same. Love it. Um, <laughs> the uh, it, it mitigates you know risk to a lot of things. Um, but what do I like about it? Or I'll, I'll let you go next. What do you like about oh. it? Um, what do I like about it? I like the fact that it allows me to do this for a job. <laughs> there's that. Um, <clears throat> I think actually that's that's part of what I like about it is the fact that it is uh, very intersectional. That basically you can be interested in kilts. You can be interested in kilts alone or Highland dress in general. You can be interested in Celtic music and you'd be interested in Scottish history. It all dovetails together in a beautiful way because it is a cultural entity and a culturally based industry. I think that's the coolest thing that there, and, and there is a sense of that. I mean, there's as much co competition versus camaraderie as you would see in any industry. Um, and you'll always have good actors and bad actors in terms of like who makes what and who's, you know, uh, good to work with or bad to work with. Uh, all those little details. But the bottom line is that everybody is in the same boat and everybody is on the same mission. And it's it's it all goes together in this beautiful mosaic for me. You know, I mean, I mean, it's odds <clears throat> are if I talk to somebody about kilts, I'm also going to be able to talk to them about history or what have you. I think that's that's what's special about it, is it's an industry built around preserving the culture. So it is it it's um it's a it's a vehicle by which the culture is being maintained and preserved so and that's kind of like what i would say all the time but it's the best way i have to put it i think that's why the industry is important at least i think that's the agreed whether and, i like it or not that's why it's important so and i'll take that and i'll build on it as well it's not fast fashion exactly it's stuff and it, so one it's not fast fashion two it's clothing that actually means something it right. says something about you, about your personality, about your heritage, about your family connections, about your confidence. It says something about a lot of things. It's not just a t-shirt. It's not just, you know, a Nike swoosh on your hat. It says something about who you are as an individual, as a human. It says a lot about you. And it's, back to the cultural thing, it's a sustainable type of thing. And to start lumping into the second question, um, about bamboo versus, you know, uh, hemp or other types of materials that you can make a kilt out of. Um, wool is sustainable as hell. <laughs> You're giving an animal a haircut and then making something with that hair. So wool is highly sustainable in that way. Um, there's companies like Scotland who are trying to, or, uh, like La Karen, who are trying to buy Scottish and you know UK produced sheep wool, therefore, mm -hmm. you know, limiting their carbon footprint even more. Um, right. But it is a sustainable type of thing. Yeah. <clears throat> I think that... Uh, so <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> right on. Okay. Um, speaking truth to fashion, the um, I think that sustainability is a very complicated topic. Is there room for experimenting with other materials like bamboo or hemp? Perhaps. Yeah, I could see I could see a wool hemp hybrid, perhaps in terms of yarn. That would be very interesting. Um, but there's devils in the details of those as well. I mean, there is a there can be a very large carbon footprint on bamboo cloth, for instance. It's mm -hmm. not as it's not as 
super green as some people think because of the processing that has to go into it and because it has to go around the globe to get to you because it's pretty much all from China, um, as far as I know. So it's a complicated and interesting issue, but I don't think that the Highlandware industry is that bad in terms of um, its footprint or sustainability as a lot of other things. I mean, you do not have the white man's clothing problem in Africa uh, due to fast fashion coming from Highlandware. It's coming from fast fashion. Um, and that's a very, very nasty topic. If you ever want to get depressed, <clears throat> find the documentary White Man's Clothing, and you'll learn all about what happens to the clothing that gets discarded in this country. So I would also say it's not, you know, made in sweatshops and those kind of things. Back to the fast yep. fashion aspect of yep. it. It's generally made in, you know, you know, countries who, you know, are concerned about about workers' health and things like that. They yep. allow exits to the building they have smoke alarms yeah mm -hmm. it's you know mm -hmm. it's it's not a a an area where they're you know worried about child labor and things like that so yep. it's generally speaking i think the highland wear industry is on very solid ground with sustainability and with you know uh, yeah quality of life shall we say one, one more reason to be proud of wearing a genuine kilt indeed. i think yeah i think indeed yeah I think I was, you know, reasonably meandering, but we tied those two together. We meander with the best of them. Indeed. Quite. All right. Oh, my Let's turn. Let's meander again, on finally. to the next question. Let's yes. do that. Da, 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 da. <clears throat> I'm saving this one to later because you told me to. Um, Roland Boshin, or Boshane, uh said, hey, I'm new to kilting. Welcome, Roland. Uh, is it okay to wear a wristwatch with a kilt? Every s image I see, no one is wearing a wristwatch. And I had some, I thought there was a weird question for a second. I thought it's actually kind of a good question. There's, there's a little bit of nuance to that. So, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I don't wear jewelry outside of a wedding ring. And if I wasn't married, I wouldn't wear a ring. Um, so yeah, it's, I'm, I'm not a, bling bling jewelry kind of guy mm -hmm. so i'm gonna you know take what i say with a little bit of grain and salt um the um i guess traditionally i would look at like pocket watches as a as a fashion accessory and that kind of thing right but um i'm more curious and again i wouldn't wear a watch but if i wore a watch i would wear a watch with a kilt if i wore watches um but the way i kind of look at it and i'm i'm actually curious about is I want to know what the the timepiece industry, so to speak, um, what has happened to the timepiece industry since, let's say, 1990, um, with the invention of the pager, with the invention of the cell phone, um, when you have a clock on your person at all times, um, do you need a watch anymore? Therefore, it's it's relegated from being a necessity to something that's just a a fashion accessory. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think. Yep. Overall, if I had to guess, timepiece sales since 1980s have probably gone gone down, leveled off, but it's now more of a fashion category than it is a necessity category. Thoughts? Hmm. I, I blame the demise of 80s boy band music. So it's probably, hmm. that's it. Once, you couldn't dance as well. With, yeah, yeah, yeah. And swatch, okay. you know. Okay. Nobody wears the swatches with a oh. kilt. Those fluorescent colors just don't go. Swatches with are still very popular in, in the the eighties. Okay. The, the yeah, neon eighties retro is oh, back but, in, buddy. Oh, I know, because pop culture eats itself on a thirty year it cycle. Does. But um, in all seriousness, I think that yeah, everything you said is accurate. Basically, wristwatches are becoming less and less common unless it is a multifunction uh, tool like a smartwatch. <clears throat> but the, it's absolutely a fashion accessory, and it is prone to um the idiosyncrasies of the fashion industry as a result you'll have styles come and go um right now the two big trends with uh wristwatches for men are either the very large oversized chunky definitely a piece of jewelry type wristwatch it's practically a wonder woman Clock bracer face. they're yeah. huge um or um there's right now also a fad for retro like liquid crystal and electric uh, digital display watches like from the 80s and even the 70s um, because again that whole 80s um, nostalgia that's been kicking in lately a little calculator wristwatch there yeah uh, no joke yeah actually yeah um, but but I think the problem is those two things is that I think sometimes you'll see people not wearing a watch just because they don't 
or um, possibly in, in our sphere, I think it's possible that some guys are not wearing a fancy wristwatch with a kilt because it's another piece of really intense blingy jewelry that's going to compete with other parts of the outfit. At least that's why I would eschew, 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 sure. eschew one. I think. Um, because A, if I'm going to wear a watch, usually it's a pocket watch anyway. Um, and it fits with that old timey vibe that I at least like. And I think a lot of guys like when it comes to kilting. Um, and B, it's, I don't want anything to distract from a, the sporin. Yeah. I still always want the attention to go to the sporin. So I think that's part of it. Um, it may also just be a, uh, a, a, on, on your part, no, no offense, man, but it may just be a, a false positive on your part. I think there probably are people wearing wristwatches. You just happen to not see the images yet. Um, or they're wearing, wearing smart watches that you just don't notice because it's black plastic, you know? I was going to say, that's the, some of the comments are coming in are, are people wearing smart watches yeah. or uh, kind of what Rocky was saying about, you know, it's everybody has a phone now that has a, exactly it, yep. that's in your sporn. But as I, who was it here? One of uh, Edwards pointed out, like he only wears, he wears a smart watch, so he's not pulling his phone out constantly. Mm -hmm. So he's, he's looking at that, but. I go in spurts with it. I will wear a watch every every now. Like if I get all of a sudden I'll get in a spurt where I'll wear it. Mm -hmm. But then I still find myself looking at this. So why, why am I wearing why, this? Why am I wearing this? Right. Yeah. Exactly. So well, I have a flip phone now, so I'm even less likely to be concerned about taking my phone out to check the time. Yeah. Than I used to be. So, but again, that's why watches are just a toy now, even more so than they were. Agreed. Yeah. It's so. not the same as they watches were a huge status symbol back in the day. Having a timepiece at all was a major <clears throat> status symbol. It, they still are. Mm -hmm. Having a having an expensive uh, insert, you know, high end watch brand here, um, you know, watch with you know lots of diamonds and bling bling bling, and it's like eight, you know it's three inches wide. You know, sure, that's going to be a like, oh wow, that dude must have money, huh? And if you care about that, great, have at it. I'm not saying you do as the guy who asked the question. I'm saying in general. Um, so, yeah, it's but it's it, it, to me, it's unnecessary. I don't care. I don't have to flaunt any of it. I just, you know, I'm plain Jane, cell phone on the table. Yeah. I was going back like two, three hundred years to where having a timepiece at all. Understood. Okay. It, but it's to to a degree, <laughs> like, it's kind of come back. You could full afford circle. to carry a machine around with you that told you what time it was. That's a power move. Same thing, like cell phones in the eighties. Uh -huh. Exactly. Yeah. No, yeah. but but yeah. I'm saying it's it's even come back around where the 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 timepiece, not just having a timepiece, but the type of timepiece. Oh yeah. In the fact that it's a fashion accessory and how expensive it is, or you know, pretends to be if it's a knockoff. Um, that's the status symbol. It's like, look okay. at my, you know, my Rolex, Folex, you know, kind of. <laughs> what watch? 10 watch. Exactly. Cool. For all you Casablanca fans out there. Kurt. Kurt is, is in, in the chat. Oh, oh geez. Um, he said, Rocky lives by a different standard. A clock doesn't tell him what time it is. He tells the clock what time it is. Yes, me and Chuck mm -hmm. Norris. Exactly. <laughs> yes. And I parallel park trains, too. <laughs> All right, so that was us, that Mac. Was us. Um, all right, so we have <clears throat> Richard. He's like, I got a weird question for you. Since Why some stop now? Yeah, yeah. Since some parts of France and Spain were Celtic nations, mm -hmm. did any Are. of them adopt tartans? Um, his he says his ancestors from France and would be more interested in getting a French tartan than maybe a Scottish tartan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think there are there are at least a couple of national ones. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I can't think. Is there one for Burgundy? I think I, the Burgundy, not Burgundy. Um, Brittany has one. Brittany. Brittany. I think there is. is are they. I'm thinking of the flag. I'm not. Are they well, like Galicia. regions or, or Galicia has a national? Like, yeah. Tartan. There's. There's. I remember seeing a, an image of France with all the tartans. Mm -hmm. I guess yeah. districts. You want to call it? Yeah. Okay. Um, it has all the tartans that are associated with them mm -hmm. on there. Um, the only one that really I can question. think of that I know has one is Galatia, and that's yeah. a newer design. It's not like hundreds of years old. Right. It may be, you know, 25, 30 years old. Um, so. Is it Galicia or Galicia? Yes. Okay. Exactly. Is, you're probably correct, and I'm mistaken, but... It's it's one of those. I think... Meh? Yeah. 
I think that those regions have been more focused on preserving their culture in other ways than uh, Tartan. Um, we know that Tartan really came into its full blossom in Scotland. So other regions have, as it, you know, it developed in Scotland and exploded and other regions started developing Tartan kind of like, oh, well, we want this too. Um, but uh, those areas didn't have that going on. What they did have was like the um, uh, food customs, language customs, and especially music customs. I mean, you know, if you've ever looked into the history of the bagpipe, there's about a bajillion different forms of bagpipes. And each of these regions we're talking about have their own form. And one of the, one of the biggest um, like bagpipe music conventions or parades or whatever is held in Brittany every year. Um, Lucas used to talk about it all the time. I can't remember the name of it, but massive, massive international celebration of the music. Um, and so Tartan has not quite been their thing. Hence, I think there's some, a few national Tartans, but they're not, they haven't really, really stuck yeah. the way, the way they have like in Wales, for instance. But, um, and I would, I would say this, the, uh, the Tartans for, nationality sake and you know celtic culture or celtic nations sakes um is a much more modern thing when you go back to you know the turn of the turn of the 19th century or 20th century with the irish wearing kilts and irish mm -hmm. nationalism it wasn't kilts tartan kilts it was solid color kilts it right. was saffron it was green it was blue yep. um cornwall solid yep. black around that same kind of time period yep um the so you're they kind of they wanted to give the nod to the Scottish kilt thing and say like hey we're we're part of the same tribe we're just a different we're a cousin so we're over here right. so we're gonna do a different thing we're not gonna do tartans we're gonna do solids and this color is gonna represent us um, so they they did that but in the 90s in 1990s and the early 2000s with the explosion of Braveheart and tartans and more people wanting kilts and more people want to get into it um, with the Welsh tartans that started to exist around that time with the Irish County tartans that existed around that time. There was just kind of a, a, a tartan explosion, not just kilts, but right. tartan explosion. And that's where those things started to glob on and want to have their own identity within tartan, not within the cultural dress, but the cultural dress and pattern. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And they didn't have the Victorians coming in and getting all goofy with their culture. <laughs> they didn't have Queen. They didn't give, have good old Queen Vic. <laughs> old Vicky. Oh yeah. Oh good old Vicky. The widow at Windsor. Exactly. What Mac, you got so, something to add? Yeah. To this. So Matt, Matt just sent me in the other room. Matt uh, just sent me a the map that I was thinking of. Oh, brilliant. Um, hopefully, then we can add this into this later. Graphic later on. Um, can put it on. But there's about forty-seven tartans uh, associated with. Uh, with France. France, so wow. Okay. Well, but those but, are also names they, or regions, and they were all probably newer. They're all regions. It looks like it all. Yeah, is, I'm betting they're newer. So, I mean, without really digging into this on the back end um, to find out when they were yeah. came about, but we can, we, I do remember making, and I, I don't remember which mill did it, but we I remember us getting a piece of Brittany in to do a sash or a scarf out of a couple accessory type. Was things. it Brittany? It was Brittany. Mm -hmm. I have a, still have a piece, a small okay. swatch yeah. of it over there. Okay. I'm going to um, assume they're all modern inventions, but I actually... But I think they're 11-ounce, love... too. Mm -hmm. I think that was 11-ounce. Okay. okay. I love the fact that they exist at I all. know, you know cool. the Isle of Man, and like there's Manx Tartan, mm -hmm. there's right. a Cornish National Tartan, and a Cornish, Cornish Hunting. Mm -hmm. There's Welsh, you know, St. David, so Welsh National, but kind of not really. Yep. That's definitely the 90s. Um, the, the Cornish ones are around the same kind of time frame. Um mm. Not Tartans quite. or 80s? Family. Well, the first Cornish Tartan was in the 60s. Okay. Um, and But the other ones are more recent. Like St. Piran Tartan, I think, was more might have been 90s. Okay. The family name ones that we've seen, I don't know. Yeah. But. So they are newer traditions. Like, there's no tradition like a new tradition. And as long as people keep doing it and there's commercial viability, it's the, it's the confluence of culture and commerce. If people like it, Mills will produce it. If mills keep producing it, more people can get it. So it's, and then that's how something sticks around. And if it sticks around for a long enough period of time, it becomes a tradition. It becomes part of the culture. It becomes a thing. So how long does it take? Don't know. I can't put a number of years. Yes. If it's 27 years, you got it. You're in there. Um, it's just how long does it stick around? Yeah. So it's funny. We, we talk about 
historic stuff and yet a lot of stuff we're talking about now is like 50 60 years old so that's history guys yeah you feel old yet <laughs> yes i'm an antique officially oh yeah yeah the two britney tartans i just found 2002 and 2003 there you okay. go is when they put in the Makes registry sense. cool there you go hope that helped all right mr mac that was yours. That was mm-hmm. it. So why would I talk to you again? <laughs> Actually, before Ooh. before we do the next one, we have our Kilt Ambassador of the Month. Hey, guys. Our ambassador today is Mr. Jason Jones of North Central Oklahoma. Jason and his wife of 20 years have four kids, three daughters and a son, the oldest of which is studying ag ed at Oklahoma State University right now. Jason, too, is furthering his education. For the past seven years, he's worked as a quality specialist for an aerospace company. But now he's working to go the next step and earn a degree to be a quality control engineer. For Jason, heritage is an ongoing quest. And connecting with his ancestors, including on a spiritual level, is his primary focus. He says that like many of us in the USA, he struggled to find a strong cultural identity. Then along came Ancestry DNA. Jason dove headfirst into genealogy and discovered connections to several clans, to name a few, Gunn, Mackenzie, Sinclair, Urquhart, and McKinnon. As he puts it, being of Scottish and Welsh descent means a lot to me today. It's a reminder of where I come from and the values that have been passed down through the generations. It's a source of pride and identity that shapes who I am. Jason has found a number of ways to connect with his past, the traditions and the stories. For instance, He's a passionate Highland athlete. He's going into his third season right now. And Jason is actively creating customs that can help his whole family to bond. Like how this past holiday season, he and his wife invited friends and family over for what they dubbed a Scottish Christmas, complete with some really tasty foods. Jason first got into kilting about seven years ago while his son was a Cub Scout. He once ran across a troop that was entirely kilted up, all the scouts and the scoutmaster as well. Quote, so I did what anyone does in this age. I googled kilts and scouting. I soon learned that Clan McLaren had very strong ties to scouting. So that was my first tartan. Jason feels he's met some of the best people in his life while at kilted events. As he puts it, kilts just bring people together. Kilts and good scotch. So I mentioned earlier how Jason feels very strongly about connecting with his ancestors in a spiritual way. Well, as it happens, he is a pagan and practices with members of the Order of Bards, Ovates, and Druids. The Obod structure allows him to blend both Gaelic and Nordic cultural inspirations. As he puts it, In the Norse tradition, there is a lot of ancestor veneration, and this is where I began to see a lot of ties that my family had to the Celts as well as to the Norse. While other Obod members may wear robes for special occasions, Jason instead wears his clan gun tartan kilt. As he puts it, dying the kilt makes me feel a much stronger connection to the ancestors than the robe would. So I asked Jason what advice he would give to a younger version of himself, and his answer was simply, enjoy the ride, because everything that happens to you now will shape your older self. It's pretty good advice. I think we could all stand to do a little more self-reflection, perhaps, also. If you want to talk to Jason about his kilts or his spiritual practice or anything else, you will find him on the Kilts and Culture Facebook group. And if you have any friends or family who you want to nominate as a kilt ambassador, just drop an email to sales at usakilts.com. Yep. Indeed. Good to you, Mr. J. Cheers. Skull. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Skull. Skull, indeed. May your disier smile upon you. Yes. Seeing as how he and I kind of speak the same language. Fair. English? Uh, Okay. Yeah. (laughs) All right. Um, Eric, if you Mm. would... Would what? Would do a question? Sure. Okay. Sure. Okay. Yeah, we're here. Might as well. Yeah, okay. Got no, no nothing else to do. do. Came here to chew gum and answer questions about kilts. I'm all oh, out of gum. bubble gum. All right. Uh, Michael Milholland said this. In the motorcycle club I used to associate with, it was common to refer to the car as a quote-unquote cage, primarily because it's so much more confining. Example, dang it, it's snowing. I guess I have to take the cage to work today. End quote. Is there a similar slang expression for trousers or other garments for the lower half of the body when one must forego the wearing of one's kilt? If not, can you 
or are you willing to come up with one? I think we should. There's some classics out there already. Yeah, yeah. But... There's there's a few, but we're gonna crowdsource the answer. This is gonna be the question of the day. So, throw it on the screen, guys. The uh, what negative nickname, derogatory term, do you have for pants? Um, now that you're wearing kilts all the time, like us. Mm. Um, we have uh, so put those in the comments. We're gonna start collecting the answers. At the end of the show, we are going to read back some of the best ones, and we are going to come up with the term, the the chef's kiss of of anti pant terminology. So the the ones that are out there currently that are top of mind. Yeah, there's a couple. Torture tubes. Torture tubes. Yep. Um, leg prisons. Mm -hmm. um, crotch crushers. I came up with. <laughs> Um, Mac, don't look at the comments, Mac. Don't comments are coming before you even said anything. Okay, okay. Um, <laughs> Kurt was I, on it. Uh, of course, of course. All right, Eric, Mac, you what do, crash what the feed. What do you guys have? Like... Don't read any of the comments yet. Don't just pretend it all exists. Don't You've look. already said the ones that we okay use most yeah. mostly around yeah. here. Yeah, I honestly didn't have anything good for this. I was okay. for once at a loss for words, which is a great track by Iron Maiden, by the way. But um. Um, bean squeezers. I don't know. Like what? What? It's it's all gonna it's all gonna. I was you know, about to say there's a certain around the focus. Me, apparently, yeah. Apparently. Yeah. Um, Mac, mm. can you think of any that aren't in the comments that you're staring no, at again? They, Mac, they are. They're 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 coming in pretty hot <laughs> and heavy right now. Okay. Oh boy. <laughs> okay. Oh boy. So we're gonna we're gonna save this a little bit for the end of the show. <gasps> ooh, ooh, um, ooh. Go ahead. No, I don't have one. It's like, what if we did a T-shirt? We'll we'll see. We're, we're crowdsourcing ideas here. Okay, this is gonna be fun. So keep them going throughout the entire show, entire oh, rest of the man. show. We are gonna be, you know, getting all these answers put together. So okay, cool. All right. Um, yes, keep going. And Max back there chuckling. So <laughs> something's good is happening. I'm, I'm excited. Are there to any this. questions? <laughs> it's, it's all turned into pants. Oh, it just. Boom, 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 yep. boom. All right, Eric. Well, I love you. Guys. Why don't you go again because. <laughs> We have, this isn't really a question, question. It's no, question no. It's a day question. Well, Michael, you asked for it, Doc. Okay. Um, we're going to come up with something good. Then we're going to have to like vote on it or. Right. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, um, David Sinclair Smith said, uh, do you feel that the kilting industry and Scottish tourism in general, for that matter, is influenced by media representations, even the inaccurate ones? i.e. videos like Braveheart, Rob Roy, Outlander, etc. And if it is, do you find sales of certain items increasing or decreasing following the popularity of such media releases? So in other words, does the industry react to kilts and Celtic stuff in popular media? And if it does, how fast, how much, which way? Yeah. Uh, much like Venom, it's a symbiotic relationship. Um, a parasite, if you will. Oh. Um, the, yes, Spider-Man Venom. Got it. Got it. Um, the, yes, one feeds off the other. Um, if people weren't excited about Outlander, about Rob Roy, about Braveheart, about all of it, about the fantastical versions of it, then, you know, yeah, then if those movies flopped and those shows flopped, then it would stop happening. Does the Scottish tourism industry benefit from that? Absolutely. freaking lutely do women's romance novels benefit from that? Oh, Absolutely. Um, I may or may not have been a model. Um, no, I wasn't. <laughs> they would never want me as a model. Um, so yes, it's it's one of those where it's it's hand in glove. It's one benefits the other, and because it benefits the other, then more people want to do the thing. So it's 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 a a trend to some it's degree. It's symbiotic. Yeah, it's a symbiotic or, relationship. It's parasitical. I yeah, it's, it's both symbiotic and parasitical. Yeah. Yes. I mean, well, I mean, it comes Probably to mind. You're, the, the, the clear example is you were, when you were at uh, Clava Cairns in January and you mentioned how people had been leaving offerings of flowers and things at a couple of the stones there because of the whole Outlander thing. And oh, Jamie like, Frazier, come take me through the stones. Oh, oh, I miss you, Jamie. Come to me. Yeah. I don't think that they're quite that 
They may. They may be. Who knows? I'm, I'm sure there's some Outlander fans <laughs> who don't have a very good grip on reality. I suspect most of them do, and for them, it's just a lark. We apologize to Outlander fans who enjoy the show and who are not of, of such thing. Yeah. yeah. So, anyway. Um... <laughs> totally lost my train of thought. The point is, I think it's... um. It's a good and bad relationship. It is, I don't know if it's a necessary relationship, but it's absolutely been a thing for like over a hundred years now. I mean, um, spoiler alert, or you know, watch this space alert. We have just wrapped up filming a new video on the history of the cinema and how it relates to Irish identity, and that is a very interesting saga and uh, an example of how popular media and the gaze of the outside world has affected things in the native country and vice versa. So whether it's Ireland or Scotland or someplace else, I think that sort of thing is always happening in the global cultural market, shall we say. Um, do we see immediate benefits from it? Usually, yeah. I mean, like Braveheart, we know, and we've discussed this before, is responsible for a lot of the boost in the popularity of kilts um that started in the 90s and things like the creation of the irish county tartans and it's because all of a sudden you know that movie really really got to people and suddenly boom you know kilts and and gallic culture was on the map so i i think you have to admit that it's had a positive impact more than a negative impact mm -hmm. um what forms it takes can be very interesting i think it's usually more vague as opposed to more specific, like I think there are more people who are interested in in kilts and stuff, uh, say because of Outlander and seeing the images of people looking awesome in kilts in their you know 18th century <clears throat> gear, versus wanting to specifically have the Fraser tartan they invented for the show. You know, what I mean, it's 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 a vague kind of like, ooh, this is cool. As opposed to, I have to have exactly that. It's not like you see more people getting into kilts because of it than people wanting to cosplay Jamie Fraser. Yeah. Agreed. Am I making sense? Yes. Yeah. Now it's and I, I love you know Dr. Rosie Wayne. You know she gave me the uh, the the she connected two dots for me that were that were like this close and I just never connected on myself. The, it's the confluence of culture and commerce. Right. It is the things that feed each other. So the uh, let think of it this way: um, the, the tourism industry in Scotland is it's a huge a huge industry. People will always, always, always want to see where their ancestors came from, mm -hmm. period. However, the industry in general has gotten a huge boost from Outlander in recent times. It's gotten a huge boost from Braveheart and Rob Roy in the 90s. Um, and it's it's very interesting. I, I want to eventually write a book on this particular thing, hmm. um, or at least make enough notes to come up with an essay, I don't know, um, on the how culture influences commerce and then commerce influences culture and how they go back and forth. Um, another one that popped in my head when you were talking about the, the history of Irish cinema, not about cinema, but about Ireland, is St. Patrick's Day. Right. St. Patrick's Day yeah. in Ireland in the 1950s was nothing. It was a religious holiday. There was nothing open. The stores are closed. You went home and you did nothing. In America, it became a big celebration. It became a party. It became parades. It became drinking. It became green mm -hmm. beer. It became all these other things. And uh, it was because of the diaspora going to Ireland like, oh, well, what what's going on for St. Patrick's Day? Nothing. Well, this sucks. So then they said, oh, well, hmm, there's money to be made here. And then exporting Americanized, you know, Canadianized, whatever versions of St. Patrick's Day back to Ireland to make it a party where it was just a a, a sanctimony. It's a, a religious sanct. No, what's the word I'm looking for? Not sanctimonious. Whatever. It's a, a religious <laughs> holiday. Uh -huh. Period. It was nothing of of a party until the outside forces made it a party, and they said, "Hey." We can make this a party and then make money off of the thing. So now it's a party because of the people that came in and did it different. Mm -hmm. So it is a way that, you know, the outside culture influenced the inside culture. It's not necessarily a good thing. I'm not saying it's good. I'm saying it's what happened. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to me that the outside forces affected the inside in the same way that the inside can affect the outside. I think there are other, a lot of other factors at work in any of these situations, especially with the situation with Ireland. Um, 
I mean, talk about the, the grip of Catholicism on the country and how that's changed over the past 30 years. That's a big topic. But um, yeah, I think it is, is, it's a double-edged sword, but it's basically what happens when you have a, a global economy and the uh, global marketplace of ideas, shall we say. Um, I'm trying to think more granularly. Like, is there anything that we've seen that has been a definite fallout from media that has been a big influence on the industry? I think there is definitely more interest in 18th century and early fashion styles because of Outlander the last few years. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a little bit of that in the background with uh, with Tweedy stuff and weather tartans becoming more popular in the last few years. I mean, it's a combination of maybe that immediate influence and also people just wanting something more earthy because it feels more natural and restorative than bright, bright colors like Grandpa used to wear, you know. Um, but I don't know. Can you think of anything specific? Yep. What? Great kills. Oh, of course. <laughs> The uh, I, I, a everything you said, I agree. Um, whether it's tweed, whether it's Victorian styling, whether it's it's a, a yeah. pen champ or something old, <clears throat> whether that's the Downton Abbey effect, the Peaky Blinders effect, those kind of things, and then pre that time period as well, everything right. old is new again. People want to go through the fashion, they want to go be the peacock, the head peacock amongst the peacocks. So, there's absolutely that in the other way, directly. Outlander, I think, and, you know, period pieces like that, looking back further, have definitely affected how great kilts have been perceived in the marketplace and people wanting to wear a great kilt. And then once you own something that costs 500 freaking dollars, you're like, I need to find more or $300 or whatever it costs. Um, I need to find more things to wear this to. I'm not going to just wear it for this. So I'm also going to, eh, let me try playing around with it and wearing it with a t-shirt, wearing it with these hiking boots or wearing it with this or going it to the, to the store in it. And you want to play with the pieces of kit that you have in your wardrobe already. And because I think there is honestly very much a financial, I've already spent the money. I'm already have it. Let me just do it with other things and see what happens. Plus it's the, 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 uh, acceptance of different modes of dress and people dressing and wearing different things than are traditionally worn, da, 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 da. all that are all these waves kind of converging at the same time to influence current day culture, whether it's Victorian stuff, whether it's uh, cosplay stuff, whether it's great kilts, whether it's, you know, men in skirts kind of thing. It's all these things simultaneously coming together right now. 2024 is the year to kick ass. Oh, that was my the apex of my speech there. What? I don't know. I went off the rails. A little bit. Okay. Too much coffee. That's okay. I guess we sort of just fill a beg the question. Ah. Uh, yeah. I think one my final shaggy dog thought would be that specifically on that is that yeah I think Outlander, we all and y'all out there probably already knew that the Great Kilt was worn with more interesting stuff like doublets and jackets and shirts and things. I think in the popular imagination, they thought Great Kilt and they thought Braveheart. They thought Great Kilt and they thought Barbarian, you know, rough and tumble warrior with a big sword. And suddenly people are like, oh, wait, you mean you could wear this thing and look kind of sharp or kind of elegant and still kind of warrior-ish. So it introduced a nuance which made it easier to wear and sparked the imagination to do the modern use of the Great Kilt as a casual thing. I think. I could be wrong. Yeah. So... But it all feeds. It's. It's. I just love how the the intersectionality of how one thing feeds off of the other, feeds right. off of the other, and then you have these these waves of things that affect the fashion in this tiny little niche that we're in. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're still in a tiny little niche in the world, but bigger fashion trends can affect this niche in the same way that you know the other things in the in the niche affect each other. So, Mac, any comments out there? Yeah. Should we get any to the next this? question? Yeah. <laughs> It's a lot of people were bringing about the Peaky Blinders, like yeah. they were comparing a lot to that. Yep. Um, a lot of them are still on your question of the day. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. I want. I want what crazy creative answers. <laughs> yes. Ha ha ha! I have unleashed oh, hounds. Boy. Indeed. All right. Was that you? That was me. All right, Mr. Mac. All right, Mr. Mac. So, Carl was asking if you could have a tartan reproduced from any TV show or film. What would you choose? And McDuck is excluded. So Good. Can't, so can't Mac say. can't pick McDuck. So this I time. can't pick McDuck. Aw. <clears throat> no. Mac. All right. Let's go around the room. 
Mac, any tartan, any show, mm -hmm. anything. I can't pick McDuck. Can't pick McDuck. But I can pick oh. Flinhart Gomgold, which is his uh, nemesis. <laughs> He has his own tartan too. Oh, he does right, nothing, have a tartan. Nothing from yeah, he does. It's bad. Flint Hart Glom Gold. Mm -hmm. Yep. Hey, McDuck was off the table. I couldn't pick that one. All right. Nothing from DuckTales. <laughs> yeah. <Woo> yeah. <laughs> mm. Um other other movies. Now I'm gonna go Braveheart. Okay. That one really? still exists. I know. Okay. Right. Okay. Would you want the plain weave, not the twill weave, the burlap sacky kind See, of effect to it? Because it, it irons historical horribly. historical side would, if I'm going to do something that's like the film, I would want to do it like the film. What? Yeah. But the film's not historical. I know. I didn't say it was. I'm doing you something. Wanna, you want to be historically accurate to 1995 like film, Mel Gibson. If I want to be like the film, I'm going to get like the film. Okay. Okay. Oh, what was the name they gave to that stupid kilt-like thing that he wore? An ancient kilt. An ancient or kilt. Yeah. 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 Well, that was one. That was one company that called it that. Yeah. We'll 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 bypass it. All right. So Mac is going brave. Scottish part. toga, more like. Um, Eric. Yeah, I had to be reminded that this existed, but uh, to my shame. But um, I was bringing up with Allie a few days ago too, actually, because she didn't know about this. But the uh, tartan used for uh, the Joker in the original Tim Burton Batman movie that Jack Nicholson wore and is actually registered as a tartan. You know, we've done that before. We've actually yeah, custom woven it. I know. There was a, a woman, uh, a, a Japanese woman in who lived in the UK who ordered from us, mm -hmm. um, who wanted to cosplay as the Joker, Jack Nicholson. So we actually did that one. Yes, it is a registered tartan. You are mm -hmm. correct. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so you're doing the, the pinkish and teal blue. Purple. And... Pinkish purple, teal yep. blue tartan. Okay, yep. okay. So that's yours. Yep. I'm going to go with the one of the the few movie tartans that I'm like it's actually not a bad it's a, it's a reasonable tartan I like the color palette is the 1995 Rob Roy Liam Neeson yeah. tartan. Yeah. That's good. I wouldn't do the 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 burlap -y kind of you know plain weave to it like Mac wants. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um but but yeah. it's it's like brown and blue. Mm -hmm. So it's got a, a weird not weathered not ancient yeah. kind of effect to it it's just it's an interesting tartan mm -hmm. i think i would i would do that one okay yeah we got a couple of people saying about the movie brave uh, from disney yep, so yep, yep. yeah you know yeah bringing that in into play here there's shrek mm -hmm. that one uh, i'm trying to think of any Wait, other... is there a shrek tartan yes in yep. the show oh in the, movie? in the movie or is it just they designed a shrek tartan the i think it's based off his he's wearing like trues yeah oh okay Okay. Yeah. What about, Adam's but, over there like, yeah, that's my Shrek tartan, baby. What about, what about Brave? Was that actually a tartan that was in the cartoon yes. or was it actually? It was in I the movie. I know they wore it. Like it's, they had it made up and wore it for the award ceremony. But it was in the movie. It was like, it, because it was like Scottish clans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. the Drumboduck tartan or something. Yeah, there's I like, forget the name there's of it. A few, well, there's a okay. few yeah. characters in the movie that mm -hmm. wear different yeah. tartans. Mm -hmm. Feast your eyes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. God, yeah. I hear that. Yeah. Um, so does that one? I'm trying to think of any other movies. Oh wow! That, that is... Go ahead. So somebody put a uh, he, he. Somebody put. Thank God. I thought for a second you were going to say legally blonde. <laughs> legally blonde. Okay. Okay. It's a uh, bright yellow. I think she's wearing bright yellow in that. Here's yeah. I think it's Lab McCloud or something. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I got. Isn't that Clueless? Is there, was it, yeah. There's, was it there's legally blonde. It was Alicia know, Silverstone. Of the two. She's in all of yeah. the movies. Yeah. Um. All right. I, I know a celebrity's name. That just short floored myself. Okay. <laughs> Here's another one for you. Take a bit of a flyer. Go. It's not really a movie, but it's TV, kind of, for one day a year. Mummer's costume. Oh. Sequin <laughs> kilt outfits, which they have done as a Mummer's yes. theme yes. For, for different groups. What? So there you go. Jason Kelsey, Mummer's okay. costume, sequin kilt. That's going so, off the question a little bit, don't you? I don't think? care. Nope. nope. The but now, I'm allowed. If you, if you move the sequins one way, does it become one tartan? And if you move it the other way, it becomes another tartan. It yeah. may. Yeah, you do that yeah. effect like yes. on those pillows. Yeah. yeah. Indeed. <laughs> See, people are always asking, how do I get more like, use out of yeah. it? <laughs> there you go. Sequin Day. tartan kilt. Yeah. Dress. <laughs> <laughs> Hunting dress tartan. Hunting dress tartan. <laughs> oh. That's the future of kilting right there. Yes. You, you know... When you're out in the fields hunting, <laughs> nothing says hunting gear and camouflage 
Like sequins. Colored sequins, yeah. <laughs> All right. That's, that's fully off the rails now. <laughs> next. That was fun. Was that you or was that Mac? Uh, that was Mac. All that right. was Mac. You're next. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Jason McClellan um, said, my wool kilt of 10 years I have, 10 years ago he's, he bought this, I've never needed to do anything for the pleats. They have always been crisp and hardly ever wrinkled, and I've never taken an iron to it. <clears throat> However, my new wool kilt, it seems, needs an ironing every or every other time I put it on. It picks up wrinkles and creases like crazy, and some of the pleat edges like to stay rounded and not crisp, even with some ironing. Are there any tips or tricks to get those pleats to stay crisp? What's going okay. on with his old kilt versus his new kilt would be my first question. Hmm. Never mind the techniques, but... Fair. Um, the, the wool fiber, you know, it, it varies from mill to mill. Um, the, the cloth varies from mill to mill. Bring Mac in for this one as well. Um, <clears throat> the So, Mac, what thoughts, questions... I'll, I'll let you go first on this. What thoughts, questions... I think he needs to eat his spinach, yeah. build up some muscle... Just okay, okay, push okay. that iron down a little bit yeah. more harder. Skittity dum and skittity do. I got some spinach for all of you. Ah, I gotta get those pleats to go out. Um, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think I think a heavier iron. If he if he can get a heavier iron, I know most home irons are usually on the lighter side. Or if he wants to yeah. even go get the the old big yeah, like cast iron iron, iron, iron one, I, uh, iron. you know, yeah, mm -hmm. use yeah. that. Um, that even just dampening. A, a press little bit cloth. and using that as a press cloth then to, okay. to help put out. But, you know, like you're saying, each mill is irons completely different. Yep. Um, some mills we get cloth and it just, it gives up when it gets near the iron and others, we really have to, we got to lay into it over there. Yeah. We're pressing it in. So it's, it's, I'd be curious to know what mill. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's if I had to guess house of Edgar, yeah, that's my, would be my <laughs> guess too. Yeah. <laughs> Hmm. <clears throat> different mills, as Mac was alluding, different mills have different you know, like pressures that you have to put into it. Um, La Caron, how is La Caron's newer cloth? Their Scottish wool. It's been fine. It's been the same as their old cloth. Yeah, I haven't really noticed too much of... with it. No, it's, okay. I think it holds a little better edge than it used to, but it's still hmm. like, I would say the ones that iron the easiest are Martin Mills and La Caron still. Yeah. Both of them just okay. take really well to the iron. Okay. Yeah. It's, we use a steam iron. <clears throat> we have a vacuum ironing table, so it actually sucks the steam down through the garment. Um, <clears throat> and what Max is talking about is the, the weight and the pressure. When you're steaming your kilt or you know, ironing your kilt, you're actually putting pressure on it to crease the wool fabric. <clears throat> um, House of Edgar's 13-ounce uh, wool, generally speaking, you got to put a little bit more pressure on it in order for it to take a crease. Um, it is a little bit more difficult where Lock Herons or Martin Mills, you know, you you wave an iron near it and it's like, ah, I'm sorry. And it just creases automatically. Um, and the other thing Mac kind of brought up was um, either dampening the cloth or using a press cloth. A press cloth meaning like get an old handkerchief or a piece of undyed cloth, get it wet, you know, wring it out so it's not, you know, it's just damp. It's not, you know, sopping wet, you know, line up the pleat, lay it down and then, you know, Put the iron directly on that. You do that so that way, if the iron is too hot, you're not shining the wool fabric underneath the uh, underneath the, the press cloth. Um, also, having that cloth wet will transfer some of the steam and some of the moisture into the kilt and allow it to kind of relax the fibers and you know compress them down a little bit better. Um, the other thing uh, I would I would suggest potentially it's it's a professional tool but you can buy them you know, essentially you know online would be a uh, a tailor's clapper um, which is a hardwood like a maple or something like that um, it's a piece of wood that once you actually you know steam you know steam the kilt and you get the the uh, uh, the fabric laid flat and it's a little bit damp you use this block of wood and you put pressure on the block of wood. And, you know, using a harder wood, it'll kind of draw some of the moisture out of the kilt. That'd be one thing I'd suggest. Um, another would be making sure after you're pressing the kilt, you're letting it rest. What you don't want to do is if you have a, uh, uh, you have a kilt and A, you might want to press it when it's a little bit damp or iron it when it's a little bit damp. 
But what you don't want to do is move it too much when it's damp. Because if you press a kilt, let's say, you know, like, like our vacuum ironing cables and a, a high pressure steam iron, you know, you, you, psh, 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 you do all the pleats, it's great, and your kilt is hot and it's a little bit damp, and you pick it up and then you, you're, you're moving it around and you hang it up and you, lay, you, know, you hang it up to dry. You've now you know, essentially gotten the steam and gotten the air and the hot air out of the kilt, and it's mm. not had a chance to set. You want to just give it some time to rest in that position. So whether it's a clapper or whether it's something else, so you put a little bit of pressure on it while it's still damp, while it's still hot, and then let it cool in the creased position with pressure on it. It will keep a, pre, a, a press a, a pleat better than it will if you're moving it around while it's still while it's still hot and while it's still you know damp. Matt was Mac. That, was that Jason who asked asked that question? Yes. Okay, so he did respond on here. Oh, nice. Um, he's here. Hi, Jason. Um, he said he's been hesitant about really to bear down on it to get it to get it to behave. Um, it is a it is a 13 ounce from Lock Heron, which I'm actually kind of surprised. Hmm. Um, he doesn't know remember what the old ones were. Yeah. Um, um, what I will say this is okay. Assuming you're in your home, all right, you don't have access to professional equipment. If you have an ironing table, <laughs> when we first started the company, way, way, way back when, we had an ironing table. And we tried to use the ironing table for pressing um, before we had vacuum ironing tables and that kind of stuff. Just a standard at-home ironing table. Um, we would, you know, press into the cloth. Underneath the ironing table is actually like grid iron mm -hmm. it's it's actually you know, if you take the pad off it's that grid so that it yeah. allows the steam to go through the table um the legs aren't <laughs> as strong as i am apparently because i remember you know like really bearing down on the kilts that we were pressing and eventually the iron table just kind of like collapsed and then i was like you know pulling it back up and then collapsing and again and i broke two ironing or an ironing table legs. And then we eventually said, okay, fine, let's put something, you know, we're going to put this table, you know, laid flat on top of an actual desk or something so I can really get up on it. Um, and then we, we kind of took to a not plywood, but we got a sheet of melamine. Mm. So it was, you know, a hard, you know, kind of surface and you could really, you know, lay into it, but the, the steam doesn't have a chance to escape through it. Mm. So that's the biggest the biggest issue with something like that. But you want to get something that you can really lay into to kind of crease it. Um, and then, you know, again, allowing it to kind of, you know, dry, stagnant on a table and static on a table um, and let the pleats really set in. Anything else, Mac? No, I, just, I was just thinking that exact scenario, of like pushing down on a, on a home ironing board, just that thing going to the, straight to the floor. Yeah, it's the problem is home ironing equipment. It's 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 meant to iron stuff like shirts, which are like six ounce, five ounce, you know, you know, thin cotton material and one or two layers of fabric, not eight ounces of thirteen ounce wool. So it's they're they're meant for light duty, not professional duty and kilts you kind of need professional duty or you need to just you know get up on it and lean into it you don't have to do a handstand on the iron but you do you do want to kind of put a lot more of your body pressure and your body weight on top of the iron um so a, a press cloth is a great idea again an old handkerchief that's you know either white or undyed cotton um again bed get sheet. It, yeah a bed sheet yep that's fine as well you don't, but the, the, the trick with press cloth is you don't want to have a bed, a full bed sheet where it covers the entire thing right. because you're, you're working with a little areas at a time. Okay. So you want to do like two pleats, three pleats at a time mm. at most, because you want to be very, very, very precise with where you're going. Gotcha. Um, yeah. So hmm. yeah, that would be my, my thoughts and tips on it as well. Hmm. Hope that helps. Cool. All right, Mr. Mac. Give me another one. All right, so one of our one of our avid Twitch followers. All three of them. <laughs> um, yes, Twitch Wolf Warden. He's asking now. This is going back in the memory bank here, Rocky. So, uh -oh. all right. So he's curious on how the mills in Scotland were approached when we were getting when you were getting USA kilts off the ground. Were they skeptical of a U.S. based kilt maker, and did they have? Did you have to do any convincing? that 
uh, convincing that what you were building was a serious business enough for a customer base. Right. <clears throat> um, good question. Um, no, I had green money <laughs> and I was willing to pay on time. Um, one thing that when, when I first started the business, I, I went to college with a, uh, a communications degree, not a business degree. I took one business class and didn't do that great. Um, so the, when I first started in business, um, it was, you know, taking out a huge loan from the bank scared the hell out of me. I would, I would never, never. And even now it would be weird taking out like a $30,000, $100,000 loan to buy goods in order to fund the business and, you know, and risking my house, risking my, you know, my, my own personal, you know, uh, you know money or whatever um, to be able to, you know, start a business. It's scary. Um, so we started the business just squarely on, you know, we would make $10 We'd put it back into the company. We'd buy something for ten dollars, sell it for twenty. Then we'd make that twenty, that extra money. We'd flip it back into the business, and we just kept flipping the money back in. So we never had to take out a loan. When at first, when we first started a business, we weren't buying from Scottish Mills. We were finding fabric down in Fabric Row in Philadelphia. Like we made low. We started out in the very low end of the market. Um, now, by the time we started buying from the mills in the UK. Um, it was, you know, we would, we would order the cloth that, you know, somebody already ordered. So since we're taking a kilt order up front, we had money to pay for it. And we never said like, Hey, we went 30, 60 day, 90 day terms on our, on our fabric. Nope. It was from day one. It's always been what's called pro forma where we said, Hey, I want to buy four yards of cloth, or I want to buy 20 yards of this in poly viscose or whatever it is. And here's my credit card. When you ship this, charge me and ship it over. So every penny in our bank account has always been our money. I've never, ever, ever had to worry about, you know, losing sleep at night over not being able to, you know, I'm not robbing Peter to pay Paul. I didn't have to worry about like, oh, am I going to get enough orders in to pay for the fabric for those kilts that I did last? Like, nope, nope, never been that. So it's always been that way with us. Um, have there been like doubts on, you know, the viability of the kilt market in the U S possibly, but it's, but it's never been a doubt that they would raise because it's like, eh, you think you can do it? Have at it. Sure. Why not? If you think you can do it great. Cause it's, I'm not borrowing their inventory or their money to do it. It was always just a, well, your, you know, your money's as green as a Scottish kilt maker, as an Irish kilt maker, as a Australian kilt maker. Sure, we'll take your money and we'll send you the cloth. Why not? So, no, it's we've always found the the Scottish mills very, very hospitable to exporting Scottish culture. Obviously, they have a they have a financial vested interest in companies outside of Scotland doing well. Sure, so they want us to do well. They want all Canadian, American, Australian, whoever it is kilt makers to do well because it's more business for them. Um, but at the same time, there's never been, we've never been treated, uh, at least we haven't as USA kilts. And I, I dare say uh, American kilt makers or Canadian kilt makers, it, we're not like the redheaded stepchild where it's where it's the, you know, the close the door behind ourselves. You're not allowed to do this or pff, fine, we'll sell to you guys, I guess. They never have had that kind of air of superiority or anything like that. It's always been a very positive, uh, uplifting community. It's a very, very small community. All the kilt makers generally know each other. All the mills know each other. It's weirdly incestuous where it's like, I'll, I'll get an email from, from our shoe supplier saying like, hey, we accidentally shipped, you know, too many pairs of shoes to this company. Will will you take them? I'll have them in America. I'll have them send them to you and I'll just add it on to your next bill. It's fine. Or the, the guy that sells us our grandfather shirts. We we overshipped to this small company. They don't need these double XLs. This actually happened two weeks ago. Can you take a dozen, you know, XL or double X black grandfather shirts? We're going to have them send them to you. We'll just charge you for them. And yeah, sure. Fine. It's fine. So it's it's a very neat, close knit community. Whether it's through uh, NACTA, which is North American Celtic Traders Association, whether it's the mills, whether it's the different suppliers, it's very much a small, 
good business environment. You know, there, there's not a ton of bad actors. The ones that are bad actors, we all know about. We all hmm. kind of trade business back and forth. If I can't help someone out with a particular product, I have no problems saying, hey, go to this guy, he's gonna take care of you. Go to this company, they have exactly what you need. We don't carry it, but they may have it in stock. Um, and frankly, that's how it should be. It's, it's a great industry to be in in that way, in that it's all very positive. It's not cutthroat in the way that some, some industries are. It's a very, very small niche, close knit community. Yep. Any thoughts, Eric, that you're writing down there? I was making my grocery list. Okay. That's fine. Mac, any thoughts from you? No, I was just, you've been I, here for a while. I, I want to see the old images of you leaving Philadelphia with your vehicle packed full of oh, I wish bolts of material existed. and just the back of that thing just bouncing down 422 or 76. <laughs> <clears throat> Kelly used to have an Equinox. There was a, uh, I forget the guy's name, Rob, was it Robert Matheson? He had a, uh, uh, it was called the Scottish Sweater Company up in Buffalo, New York. And it's since gone defunct, but he was an old, old, old Scottish guy. Um, and he made, he had a, a, a Highlandware slash Scottish sweater store hmm. and he made keychains. He made keychains for all the major auto manufacturers. He had a, a huge, huge, huge business and he was closing up his sweater and, and kilt company. And he called us or one of his secretary called us way back in like 2004 or five and said, Hey, we have bolts of poly viscose cloth from Martin Mills. And you know, it's it was Royal Stewart, Scottish National, and Gordon, I think, were the three tartans. And he has like, we have like eight bolts of this cloth, and we have all these sweaters and stuff. Well, you know, do you want any of this stuff? I'll give it to you for like crazy low price. So Kelly and I drove up in her Equinox <laughs> and loaded the back of this thing with these tartan bolts of cloth. And it was like riding on the back <laughs> axle. And she was so, so, and she's still so angry with me. And if she's, if she's in the comments, she will 100% verify this. <laughs> we were literally blocks from Niagara Falls. And I'm like, no, we we drove up that morning and drove home that night. We drove like left uh. at like seven in the morning, got home at two in the morning. And I wouldn't let us go <laughs> to wow. Niagara Falls. Like, no, 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 we got to go home. We got to work tomorrow. Now, have wow. you been to the falls since? No, no. Of course not. Uh, no. That was her only time. No, that's, that's, it's going to be like my gag thing till we die. I will take her anywhere in the world aside from Niagara Falls. <laughs> yep. Nope, not allowed. You're close enough. Yeah. It's, nah, you, you can it's smell it. It's roll the window down. You may be able to hear it. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so. Yes, no, but it's it's a great close knit industry. I'm it's an industry I'm very very happy to be in, and I mm -hmm. love supporting the community, supporting Scotland, supporting Ireland, supporting the UK in general. Um, it's it's good stuff. Yay! Yep, and there was much rejoicing. Yay! All right, so <laughs> I'm gonna be the Debbie Downer now. I'm gonna go from this. What's new? This great emotional high about being your own man, charting your own course to death. David R. Celebrese, Celebrese, uh, Celebrese. Yeah. Very Italian. Sorry, David. Um, asked us a while back, actually, not to be morbid, but before one passes on, should one put one's kilts into the will? What would each of you do? Any special instructions you have on that topic? So, okay. what are you going to do if you're going to? Pass on, <clears throat> and you have kilt. I'm going to expand it to other Highland stuff. Okay. Celtic stuff. Okay. Did you put your kilt in your will? Um, or, or do you get buried in it? How many kilts do you have? So, which one is he buried in then? <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite one? Ooh, now you got a choice. Yeah. Um, I I would start with your inner circle. Is there... Is this... Do you have a family kilt? Do you have your wedding kilt? Do you have a kilt that is... You know, in your family tartan, it's been in your family. Was it your father's kilt? Um, in that instance, sure, I would probably put it in the will. Um, if you have one child, great, goes to them. If you have multiple, you know, children, especially if there's multiple males who would actually wear the kilt, you know, as as part of their 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 cultural heritage, then <clears throat> sure, I would. I don't know, I. I would probably pick the oldest male and kind of go that way. That's a bit traditional, old timey, but that's fine. Um, or if one of them, like really, if if the younger kid is into it 
and the older one, eh, not so much, then maybe give it to the younger one. Um, give it to the one who appreciates it more. Um, if you have multiple kilts and you have, you know, multiple kids, great. Give them each kilt. Um, but the, the things that mean a lot to you won't necessarily mean a lot to them. So if you're, if you're a serial kilter and you have some family kilts and you have some fashion kilts and you have some utility kilts and you have this, that, and the other thing, um, how do you, how do you plan your death? Um, well, you can well. plan your death. Please don't. Um, now if you have, if you have a terminal illness and you let's, let's for, for morbidity's sake, let's assume they know that they're going to pass. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, I would maybe sell them off or give them away mm -hmm. to members of the group. Um, if you have do it like a Facebook group or something like that, members of the community where they're going to get use, you don't want to just, you know, uh, give it away to goodwill necessarily because you know, it's, it's just going to languish in the back of the goodwill store forever. Um, what I would personally do is say, okay, I'm, I'm about to die. I have three months to live. Cool. I have 40 kilts to get rid of. I may put together a document and say, Hey, people of this group of that group of that group of communities that I'm a part of, um, who fits these measurements? I want to start gifting people kilts. I might, I might qualify it and say, look, if you, if you have two kilts or less, or if you're on a fixed income, or if you can't afford a kilt, or if you happen to be this exact, you know, clan tartan that I happen to have a kilt in, um, I might kind of prioritize those in order to help uh, people who wouldn't otherwise be able to afford an eight yard kilt if it's an eight yard kilt or whatever, and try to get it to the right hands, to people who would actually care about this stuff and who would want to give it new life. I wouldn't want it to just go languish in a, in the back of someone's closet, languish in a, in a thrift shop or for God's forbid, you know, just go into a landfill. So I'd start there. I'll let you kind of chime in and jump in with this as well. Um, I don't think I have a lot to add, but I think that, um, uh, number one, you're going to die. Uh, not don't, me. Don't I'm assume. Forever. Sure. You let me know how that works out for you. Um, so coming up with a plan, if you're of a certain age makes, just makes sense. Um, you're going to reach a point where you need to have those difficult conversations with your family. Um, these are essential conversations to have. And if you want tips and tricks on how to do it effectively, I recommend checking out the website of the order of the good death. It's a group of people who uh, uh, try to work together to um, promote family bonding and uh, satisfactory end of life scenarios so that everybody goes away with the best possible experience um, because it's not easy and the industry and our culture are really not on your side with this stuff. Now, I would argue that a kilt is a very, very difficult thing to consider as an heirloom. If it doesn't fit exactly or if it has some wear and tear or if the level of interest that the family member has is not as passionate as yours, uh, it could become a burden. So I would want to start with having honest conversations about the level of interest that people have. I think that other parts of your Highland gear, kilt pins, a ski and do, even a sporin, cap badges, jewelry, things like that are much, much, much easier to pass on and people can have, and even if they're not gonna use it, they still have it to hold and to look at once in a while or show to friends or show to their kids, okay? It has a certain kind of longevity and social glue that a kilt does not because a kilt is a big freaking awkward piece of cloth unless you're putting it on your body. Um, I think that there's something to be said for being more creative with it also, <clears throat> that basically you could say, hey, I want you guys to have these. Feel free to be creative with it like Use it for a, a photo, you know, like, like do, do the, we talk about this for other verses also, like do the wall hanging with it, you know, turn it into something, use it, you, give it to Aunt Susie who does quilting and have her make a quilt of uh, pieces of the tartan. Okay. Do something that's going to be meaningful to you. I won't be around to worry about it, but I want you to be able to enjoy it. Give them that option. Okay. Um, don't let your kilt become a sacred cow. <laughs> it's a strange way to put it, but, yeah. um, I think that's, that's critical to know. Um, <clears throat> All of this depends on having honest communication up front. I, I very definitely agree with the whole point about um, giving things away. Uh, I think that um, you hear a lot of talk these days about downsizing when you're in, in your twilight years. I think that that can be a very cathartic and healthy thing for all concerned. 
And you could help some kid who is passionate about their heritage, who's just getting into this, can't afford a kilt. You could be doing them a huge favor by giving them a kilt and a story that goes with it. So don't limit yourself to your family with this stuff. You know, I think I think that's a really good way to think about it. Um, yeah, but other than that, everything you said is absolutely the logical way to go. Um, it's not easy, but the conversations need to happen. Um, and I will. I wanted to throw in, this is very tangential, but I wanted to throw this in just because it's a fact. If you are considering being buried in your kilt, realize that in the process of dealing with your body, a mortician will probably have to do things to the garment that your family may not want to think about. Very typically, if you are laid out in a suit jacket, for instance, the suit jacket is actually slit up the back so you can actually get it onto the body. So it looks fine when the body is lying there in the coffin, um, but it's actually destroyed in the process. So if you have some kind of an emotional feel about you want this thing to be intact going into the afterlife or something, um, be Include aware. It with the Yeah, just put it in the coffin. It, you yeah. might almost just want to do that or, or unstitch it and turn it into a shroud that goes over the coffin, something like that. Be creative um, and absolutely, you know, get the will written. So. Yeah. I would, I would, I would not yes. to be morbid, but my sister and I are kind of into this stuff. We've studied it a lot. So, you know, your point about going beyond the family. I agree. Absolutely. I would, I would only say start with the family, sure, start with course. the inner of family course. and close friends. And mm -hmm. I'll extend it to that. Mm -hmm. And then from there you go beyond to the community. And the, the thing now I am extremely lucky in that my brother and I, you know, get on very, very well. Um, and my mom, you know, since my dad has passed, my mom has been very transparent and we've had multiple, you know, kind of off the cuff at a family gathering. If it's my brother and I happen to be there with my mom, we'll talk about things like, okay, well, you know, Hey, you know, once I pass, you know, this painting is worth a lot of money. Don't just give this away. Or right. this thing is just costume jewelry. Don't worry about this, but this is my diamond ring. And we'll have those discussions. It's weird. The first times, the first few times you do it and it's still freaking weird. Um, but you want to have those discussions and be very, and I, I, there's one thing that I, I would wish for people, um, who have family members and I know not everyone is this lucky and it's sad when they're not is for the siblings to get along. Um, when a parent passes, mm -hmm. I can't imagine like just knowing my brother and how he and I feel about each other. I would never fight with him over the money or over any particular thing. Um, and it would be one of those where it would be like, okay, well, you really want it fine. I'll let you have it. And neither of us are like greedy in that way, but I can't imagine having a relationship where that would come into play or you'd have yeah. to factor that in. And yeah. I feel horrible that people would have to go through that. So it would, I would, if you are a, a parent with more than one child, I would say, have discussions with both of them, especially if they don't get along Absolutely. and say, look, guys, you know, I know you have some beef back and forth about this thing or that thing or whatever. Let's just kind of go through some things and I'm going to write down, put sticky notes. I remember when my, when my grandfather died, my grandmom said, you know, look, put sticky notes on the things in the house you want. Yeah. So that way I'll write it down for you and you'll each know exactly what you're going to get. These are weird discussions to have. And you don't want to think about your family members, you know, your your older family members dying. Or if you're the older family member, you don't want to think about, you know, the strife that's going to be left in your wake. But these are very, very, very important conversations to have. Mm -hmm. So you need to write it down. You need to have lists. Even if you don't go out through the whole process of writing a whole new will, just have a list that exists somewhere near your will, near the documents yeah. where it's it can help put off any fights because the one thing that, you know, if you're going to come back and haunt somebody, it's going to be like, <laughs> don't be fighting kids. You know, so you're, you, you would, you would not rest easy knowing that your right. kids are fighting over your stuff um, right. or family heirlooms over, over money or whatever. So making sure that stuff is all buttoned up as much as it can be. And it's never a hundred percent but getting as much or as close to good or perfect as you can make it, mm -hmm. you're going to make their lives easier. I, like when my mom goes away, she, she lives half her life in Florida and she has a, a document 
sitting on the counter in the event of my death. Here's mm -hmm. all the things. Here's the people you contact. Here's the here's where the bank exactly. accounts are. Here's all the things. Go. Yep. Um, so it's it is a gift you are giving to your kids, whether they know it or not, whether they care right now or not, whether they think it's weird and morbid or not. It doesn't matter. Do it. Yep. Because you're helping them get through a what will be a very difficult process in missing you and trying to put the pieces together and not knowing what is happening and where things are while grieving. Doing that kind of thing is definitely going to help them out. Right on. Cool. I'm in. That's basically it. Yep. And and in the process, of the, the conversation will be difficult at first, but it gets easier yeah. the more you get into this. And the silver lining is that this is an opportunity to get some of those stories passed on for sure and cemented. Yes. Yes. Okay, because the memories are going to be very important, um, more important in some ways. So it's a three-legged stool. It's a, a will, a living will, and an end-of-life plan. In other words, who's going to do what, how you want to be processed, um, all that kind of stuff. Okay, if you can get those in place, then um, it'll be good for the harmony of the family. Um, and I think, yeah, I mean, I think it's wonderful to be able to have something like a kilt that you can pass on. I mean, to get to back to the original point, I think it's a wonderful idea and I would absolutely do it if they want it. And I'd want them to be honest with me about it. Yep. So I'm, I'm going to give one more weird flyer of a thought. Hmm. Um, and it, it, frankly, it's part of the reason why I do all of these videos for posterity, for your kids, for your grandkids, for your sixth great grandkids. Here's what you do. If you have one, two, seven kids, doesn't matter what it is, have them over, have someone set up a camera, put their cell phone on a tripod and record and just have a discussion about your parents, about your grandparents, about mm -hmm. all the family stories you know of and record it. Just have it mm -hmm. and then throw it up on YouTube or on Vimeo or whatever it is. It's going to get six views. It doesn't matter. You know who the six views are? Your grandkids. And they're going to have those stories and that conversation 50 years, 100 years, 200 years from now. And they're going to be able to go back. Imagine if you were able to see your great grandparents over in Scotland in 1827 and the stories that they wouldn't have been able to tell you living in their times and their grandparents. Wouldn't you love to have that? Mm -hmm. Give that gift to your grandkids and your great grandkids. Yep. Bam. Yep. All right, Mac. <laughs> yes, sir. Question of the day was what uh derogatory terms, what insults do you have, what little barbs, what little, you know, get them. Do you have for pants? So what has the audience come up with? Give me your list. <clears throat> All right. So uh, Matt was gracious enough to compile a list for us as we were continuing the show here. Thank you, Matt. Um, so there was lots of answers to or lots of responses, uh, as Alexander May said. Uh, torture tubes was was on there a lot. And, yep. and uh, Callie Frazier also, along with a bunch of others, said leg prisons. So mm -hmm. there were there was quite that. Um, William Marshall put the furnace as opposed to <laughs> okay. AC. Mm. Okay. Uh, mm. Gnome put ball biters. Ball biters. That's okay. that's down your alley. The yeah, way you're going crunchers, there. Ball biters. Yeah. Um, I like the alliterations we got going on. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. Um, uh, Robert uh, put uh, nut crashers. Nut mm. crushers. Sorry. Nut, nut crushers. crushers. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, we have nut oven. Um, Aaron Wallace put uh. <laughs> Leg stranglers. Okay. Um, Jacob uh, put uh, movement suppressors. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, Very technical. More of an engineering term. Yes. Indeed. Aaron Peabody, leg irons. Leg irons. Leg okay. irons. Um, okay. Kirk had 8,000 answers to this question. <laughs> okay. Give me, give me. Um, Kirk's got a great, great. Uh, uh, Matt did highlight two of them. He brought out. Only two. Okay. Uh, but they, there was, there was a lot more. Um, leg turtlenecks, like and okay. uncreative pocket holders. Okay, were the two that that okay. Matt pulled out. Um, okay. our uh, Robert Weatherington, uh, sack sweaters. 
Coming from a priest. There you go. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, Mike Ramsey put knee sleeves. I was going to say leg sleeves. leg sleeves was going to be mine. Mm, knee yeah. sleeves alliterates nicely. I like that. Yeah. Knee sleeves. Aaron Wallace, uh, r- restroom restrictor. Hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, we have uh, thigh squeezers from Cali as well. <laughs> one, and they also did another one. One true love. True as like uh, trues. Okay. Uh, okay. Alan put uh, fig follow, fig floggers. So I don't want to flate my fig flog. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> wow, right. that was pretty creative. All right, thank you. I think <laughs> keep it going, boys and girls. <laughs> keep it going. The if any of you out there have more names, put them down in the comments. I want to get. All the names we have to come up with the new, the new phrase for pants. <laughs> we need to go to war with Levi's in social media. I think oh, this yeah, should yeah, be yeah. a thing. I think this should be a thing. We should attack Levi's and other jeans companies on social media. We can make this happen. Mm-hmm. All right, boys mm-hmm. and girls. Until next time, everyone. Thank you for joining us. In Slange of Ah. Slange of Ah. Wish they all could, could be, be West <laughs> ladies. Yeah. yeah. Canarfing girls. Cardiff girls. Cardiff girls. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) I'm going to filk the whole thing now. (laughs) Those Edinburgh girls got lots of class, but yeah. (laughs) Swansea girls. Yep. You, me, and Mac is the Beach Boys. <laughs> 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 <laughs>